computer. Okay. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mudit Mittal and uh, welcome to our webinar series. This is our 12th webinar and uh, welcome to Incos India chapter. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to introduce the Incos India chapter a little bit. So the Incos Central has uh, over 18,000 members and we have about 53 technical working groups. And uh, we uh, and the Incos India chapter actually has been has been getting many awards in the last three uh, many years. So from 2015 to 2018, we have been consistently getting Silver Circle Award. And we won a Gold Circle Award in 2019. And recently, we got the most improved performance in one year award in the IS 2020. And um, we started as an India South chapter in 2010. And we have over 160 individual members with and also 180 CAB associate members within Kose India. We have 61 SCPs, uh, two ESEPs, 17 ASEPs, and 42 CSEP uh, professionals. And as of now, we have three local technical working groups, currently active working groups, which is the architecture working group, the MBSE working group, and the PHM working group. Uh, it is a moment of great joy that uh, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. So INCOSE is celebrating 30th anniversary. And as a celebration, uh, we are doing this webinar series uh, along with other activities. And without uh, further ado on that, I would like to introduce our esteemed speaker of uh, today. So we have Dr. Swaminathan Natarajan. Uh, he's a chief scientist at TCS Research and Innovation. And uh, we have the pleasure of him talking today on the topic of knowledge-centric integrated systems modeling. And uh, uh, I think with that, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, and I'll stop sharing and let, let's start the topic for today. Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll, uh, I'll turn off my camera. I'm a little unsure about my internet bandwidth. So I'm sure. not sure, sure that it'll actually work well. Okay. Um, I was just telling. Uh, Mudir, we have a relatively smaller audience and uh, I'm used to being a teacher. So just feel free to interrupt with questions anytime. What I would request is let us separate clarification questions from discussion questions. Discussion questions, please keep to the end. But if you have clarification questions to you know just understand better uh, what I'm saying, then I, uh, let's take it uh, immediately. Okay. Um, okay, so this topic it's on knowledge centric integrated systems modeling. It's actually research from TCS with my colleagues, Anand then Subro and Rahul. Okay. Um, this is system science work. In fact, I'm part of the INCOSI system science working group. Um, this talk is a little unusual in the sense that some level it is research, but at some level you'll find it's very, very simple material. It's very obvious. There is in fact, none of the ideas are new ideas. It's really a synthesis of existing understanding. But the synthesis actually solves many of the issues we are facing with systems today. Really, the go one of the goals of system science working group is to talk about what are the system science foundations of systems engineering. They're doing systems engineering. There's a whole area called system science. Obviously, there should be a linkage. But if you ask today, what is the formal linkage? System science is things like system dynamics, chaos theory, all very interesting stuff. But somebody asks you, and how is that used in systems engineering? You would say, mm, mostly it's not used. Okay, so that is the gap we are trying to bridge. So, and really I'm talking about fairly simple ideas. The basic problem is, you know, as engineers, we work with system models, we work with knowledge, and these days we also work quite a lot with data, log files, data. This is the basic stuff of engineering. Obviously, they should link up, right? They should system models should link to knowledge models, and both systems and knowledge models should link to data science. But today, do we do that? Data science works off in its own territory and tells you about the system. We build system models. Knowledge is in our heads. At the level of tooling, we don't really link them up. So this is really asking, how do we actually link them up? And so it's basically a conceptual approach based on system science that looks at these as contextualized and decontextualization. It is system science, which means nothing is being invented. We are simply articulating and linking up what there is already. So it is pretty obvious ideas being put together in a 
uh, way that is hopefully intuitive and sensible. In terms of what we will do, we'll start by looking at the generative levels in understanding a system. Then we will spend a bit of time on knowledge modeling and see how is knowledge formed. Okay, what is the basis of knowledge? How is knowledge formed? And then an idea called the type or the direct, directed acyclic. So basically, a type hierarchy and knowledge frames. And then systems modeling, where we will look at the notion of how do domains connect with each other and what should be the content of system models. And basically, a genetic block model. How should you model a system? Then we will look at the problem of modeling behavior. How do you model data and how do you model observable behavior? And then we'll come back to the framework and say, how does the framework work as levels of contextual and decontextualization? Okay, so this is the basic outline. Um, so the basic theme here is that you can look at a system in terms of generative levels. On one end, you have knowledge, you have basic genetic system knowledge, then you have knowledge in so many different domains. And then you have knowledge about the elements in the real world, the actual things that you are modeling. You have all of this knowledge. Based on it, we create system models in terms of structures and events. When these system models execute, they generate, you know, at runtime, you start getting this occurrences, event occurrences, process instance occurrences, and so on. That's what happens at runtime. This in turn generates outcomes, right? The behavior which produces data which in turn generates stakeholder value. So this is the basic generative levels in a system. And then of course, you have intent systems which look at stakeholder value and do designing and maintaining and operating, managing, optimizing, transforming, all kinds of human activity systems that define both the system model and the knowledge in order to improve stakeholder value. You can actually see that this is the space of intention. There is a space of what happens in the system and there is a cognitive space, which is our understanding of the system. And this half is on the solution side, that's on the problem. So, uh, sorry to interrupt, we have a question. Uh, sure does does sure. knowledge also include these standards? Uh, yes, you know, the, the standards are always about knowledge. They are either about knowledge of the activity systems. What are the processes for designing, processes for measuring? and so on, or they are knowledge about the system, like what are the quality attributes of systems. So all knowledge standards are exactly either systems knowledge or engineering process knowledge, one or the other, at least the SC7 standard, system software engineering standards. Um, if you look at the nature of occurrences, you have basically got uh, you know, uh, uh, various events, the system itself can trigger occurrences, intents can trigger occurrences, and of course, the, what is happening in the system, what is happening in the environment state, both feed into the occurrences. The reason I'm focusing on the occurrences, this is the missing level. What we see is we spend a lot, we, this is a lot in our heads, this we model with our tools, this we measure with data science, but this intermediate level, we put relatively little focus it is there in simulation tools and it's there in testing. But otherwise, we don't actually model enough about what happens at runtime. But really, if you look at it, all the behavior is generated by the runtime thing. So you can actually look at the occurrences and from the data, you can reverse engineer a system history. And of course, when we debug, that's what we are doing. In our heads, we are constructing what happened at runtime. And then that learning helps you to fix the system and sometimes to learn new things. You can look at this as a process of decontextualization. Outcomes are very context specific. Operation is also context specific. Systems are a little bit more uh, across time. And then knowledge is even more generic, You're abstracting it away from a very specific. So as you go down this way, you're actually decontextualizing. And as you go up this way to do engineering, you're contextualizing. And the contextualized decisions are driven by a flow from this side that says, what is the stakeholder value? Therefore, what outcomes do we want? Therefore, what operations do we need? Therefore, what system decision should we? So this is the process of engineering is actually a double flow this way and this way. And you're actually reconciling the two and creating an engineering design that provides us. So really what is happening is, if you want to understand what is going on in the system, you really have to focus a lot on occurrence and system history. But the modeling and tooling isn't doing enough on this. So today it's all tacit knowledge. 
So one of the things we'll do is we'll look at how you can do action problems. Linking the problem space and solution space. It's actually a missing link in the way we handle things. Um, so first let's look at knowledge. What is the nature of knowledge? So from a system science point of view, we would say first of all, what exists is a world of experience. The world has things happening in it. Anytime we create knowledge, we create models, we are throwing a conceptual net in order to explain the world. So whatever we create by way of models is not reality. It is a conception of reality that we have created through science and so on to try to explain what is going on. Okay. And this is happening not only in science, but even in normal human interaction where anytime something happens, we try to make sense of it. We build patterns and whatever we do with systems exercise is reflecting the conceptual structure that humans have formed to explain the world around them. And if you look at any of the fields, so science, engineering, management, social systems, everywhere we are actually understanding the world in terms of systemic cause effect. So the same system science principles are the foundation for pretty much all the knowledge building that humans do. And then we can map that understanding to a mathematical space so that we can do reasoning and manipulation. Okay. So in our work, actually I'm limiting it only to mechanistic systems. I'm not really going into human systems or anything like that. Okay. But you will see that the foundation, the design so as to be extensible eventually to human systems. One of the most basic and nice ideas that have come out in system science recently is the simple idea called the systems phenomenon. This person called Bill Schindel who says, look, really there's a very, very basic phenomenon that you have regions, call it entities or things, but space time has regions. They have a state that state influences the interaction among things. So any kind of interaction is influenced by the state of all the participants and the nature of the interaction is modifies the state of the participants. So this creates a loop. And this loop creates behavior. So the very, very fundamental systems assumption is I can describe the world in terms of entities with properties and state and interactions among them. The state influences the interaction, the interactions influence the state. And this gives a generative cycle from which all behavior arises. So it says this is a very, very simple fundamental thing or goes all the way back to Hamilton's principle in physics. And it says there's a unified generative cycle across um, the entire universe. That is, there's a book called From Quarks to Culture, which traces how this generative cycle uh, takes you from the atomic level all the way to having culture and sociocultural systems. That at every level you are generating higher order behaviors through operations of this basic cycle. When we say state, of course, we mean state and structure. Another way of expressing the basic systems axiom is any outcome comes from interactions over the structures and structures include both the system and the context. So uh, the system structures and the context lead to interactions, which produce outcomes. What do we mean by outcomes? Observable behavior, change in the system, change in the environment. Again, when we say use the word outcome, you want to remember, it may mean that you both have changes within the system and changes to the environment. Both are the nature of behavior. The next thing we do is look at the formation of knowledge. So the basic simple idea of the formation of knowledge is there is a world out there. We observe the world and form all kinds of models. These could be linguistic models. These could be structured models in tools. These could be mathematical models, but in one form or another, we form models. And then in order to form the models, we need a vocabulary. Where does the vocabulary come from? You go through a process called commonization. So look at a word like tree or dog. Where does tree or dog come from? Many of you may have heard the idea. There is no such thing as a tree. There is a banyan tree and there's a banana tree and there's a mango tree. And in fact, there is even more specifically, there is this tree in the backyard, in my backyard, which I call a mango tree and so on. But there's no such thing as a generic mango tree. That's only this tree. We assign labels to it saying it is a tree. It is a mango tree. These are all human assigned labels that come from commonization. We observe similar objects because they exhibit similar characteristics and behaviors. Eventually we classify them and say, this is a tree. This is a mango tree. This is a dog and so on. So commonization is the process by which humans form a vocabulary and associated knowledge about 
attributes, behaviors, etc. But apart from commonization, we do one more process called abstraction. So you see a candle sitting on a table and there's a mirror and it forms an image. And you look at that and say, there is a light source. The light source forms on a, falls on a, you know, has beams that falls on a reflecting surface and then forms an image. So what we have actually done, we have abstracted away table and candle and so on and mapped it to an abstraction called light source and mapped the mirror to an abstraction called a reflecting surface and so on. Okay, so um, the way you form theory, in addition to simply observing the world and commonizing and observing what is common, you also look at one particular aspect, an abstraction. So you look at it from a particular viewpoint and say relative to this viewpoint, things that look very different. I don't care whether it's a time candle or a torch or some other light source. Whichever it is, it's a light source, it behaves the same way. So by focusing on only one viewpoint and eliminating other information, we are able to create even more patterns. So basically the way you form knowledge is, you look at instances, find what is common, take the cases, map them to rules, put the rules together, form models. And we are able to do that both in the commonization space and in the abstraction space. So this is the fundamental nature of knowledge. To see the difference between commonizations and abstractions, I think about network router versus network routing. If I tell you knowledge about network routers, you're thinking about knowledge about a thing, including its form factor, how many ports it has, and so on. If I tell you knowledge about network routing, you are thinking about the abstract problem of routing and what is all the theory involved in moving messages from one place to another. So that helps you anchor the difference between commonizations and abstractions. Okay. So this is a very simple understanding of the nature of the formation of knowledge. Why is it important? So let us actually look at, <clears throat> from a system's point of view, what happens when you have something like a GMRT dish antenna. GMRT is a, a radio telescope in Pune, near Pune, that we worked with. So you may have a very, very specific object in the real world. An antenna number 31, on this particular day at this time, okay, uh, connected to this physical power supply. This is what exists in the real world, right? But then if I just tell you antenna number 31, this is an abstraction across time of this thing. Okay, it is actually different at different points in time, but we understand an abstract object called dish antenna. And if I go further and say in general, this is the antenna number 31, which is a specific object, but then I can uh, abstract it to a type, a 30 meter fiber optic dish antenna, and we understand this object. And then I can abstract it to a domain type dish antenna, and then further to a receiver, a device, and further to aspects steerable element, signal reception, instrument, asset, and so on. So if I ask you what is the type of GMRT dish antenna 31, which of these types is it? The answer is all of them. So the actual type of any object, anything, any element in the real world is a complete type dark. It's a whole collection of types. Why is that important? Let us look at what happens about viewpoints and what is the nature of knowledge. So this is obviously too small to read, but <clears throat> what I'm actually saying is, if you look at a dish antenna, <coughs> you have knowledge about it, like what are the different concerns? What are the properties? What are the partner's roles? What are the interactions it participates in? What are the parametric equations and so on? Where did all this knowledge come from? If I go look at one aspect, like a power load, I'll see the same things. Power load has particular concerns, particular roles, particular states. If I look at equipment, I'll see equipment has particular concerns, roles, states, etc. And then we, these aspects come together, right? So if you look at a device, it actually combines an equipment aspect with the power load aspect, with the general device aspect. And then addition and adds to that a lockable element and a steerable element and so on. So the way knowledge about earthing arises, you are actually pulling together knowledge from all the lower levels in the hierarchy. And then if you start to look at viewpoints and say, I'm interested in a physical viewpoint, I'm interested in a safety viewpoint, a power viewpoint, a signal processing viewpoint, what happens is you have object in the real world such as dish antenna, or for that matter, a relationship or a state or something. And you project it into the viewpoint based exactly on these relationships. So if you project the GMRT antenna to a power load, that's what will go into the power viewpoint. If you project it to a physical asset, that's what will go into the physical view and so on. So the way you actually construct a viewpoint is by projecting based on knowledge of real world entities and so on. Nothing new about it. We all do this in our head. 
but how many of our tools, tools actually support the idea that we have an object, it knows automatically how to generate all the different viewpoints of the object. There is no reason it shouldn't, because this is the fundamental nature of human knowledge. We know the characteristics of a thing, and we know it as a combination of n aspects. We already know it like that. So we really ought to be organizing knowledge that way. We just don't do it. Okay, and the notion that you know uh, you can actually create libraries of aspects and objects to build. They'll make it the same. Bill Schindler is actually doing something called PBSC, which is sort of based on that idea, pattern-based systems engineering. And if you ask, how do I actually capture knowledge? You notice that I was using the same template at all these levels. It actually means there are generic templates for knowledge. This is what this is. He's actually saying there's a general knowledge frame for entity. There's a and whichever viewpoint I'm talking about, whichever thing I'm talking about, you can always capture it using the same knowledge frame. And then weave, essentially merge. This aspect weaving, right? They're actually taking this content and this content and adding them together to get this. This is called aspect weaving. Many of you would have heard of the area of aspect weaving. It's really what is going on. The problem is something like aspect weaving has been viewed as a programming problem of how do you merge code from different aspects rather than thinking of it as actually fundamentally more fundamental theory about the nature of human knowledge. Okay. Whereas if we organize knowledge that way, that would actually be much more powerful. Okay, so this is the basic idea. And notice that when you do this, you are modeling knowledge the way you model, I mean, modeling knowledge the way you model the system. That is, you are modeling it in terms of dependencies and uh, varieties and behaviors and the equations. So when you actually model a system, what are you modeling? You're modeling the attributes, properties. You're modeling the, the interactions. You should be modeling the variety, all the equivalence classes of it and so on. You should be modeling the equation. So really you're aligning, modeling knowledge the same way you model the system. So once you have knowledge about a thing, your system model is basically a customization of that knowledge. So that's what this does for you. So now let's look at system modeling. Um, I'll stop here for a minute. Any questions? If you have clarification questions, I'm willing to take. Yeah, I don't see any questions on the chat, uh, but audience, if anybody has a question, please add. Okay. I think we are doing okay on time, so we are fine. I'm not doing as slowly as you. Yes. Okay, the next part, let's look at system modeling. Here we are looking at a very simple question. How do two things connect to each other? Especially how do two knowledge domains connect to each other? Consider, for example, your system has a dish antenna and a transformer which provides power. What is the relationship between the dish antenna and the transformer? If you look at it, the dish antenna has properties such as location coordinates and maybe a bunch of things related to power. Obviously, there are many, many more properties, but these are things that are relevant from the point of view of power. Now, how does a dish antenna view the transformer? It doesn't even know transformer. What it knows is there is a power supply. And the power supply has a profile. What is the location? What is the available? What is the power QoS? And then the dish antenna says, if you tell me these things, I can match it up with these things. And if I have any shortfall here, I know how my behavior is going to change. So this is the nature of dish antenna knowledge. What about transformer? Transformer says, yes, I have properties, but I don't know anything about dish antennas. All I understand is a concept called a power load. And the power load has a profile, a location, a demand, a demand profile, the ability to curtail the load if necessary, and so on. And says, so if I have a whole collection of power loads, I know how this system works. So essentially we're saying power domain knowledge, okay, you can use to build a power systems viewpoint and analyze it as a system, apply those equations based on this role profile. Here, you can have interferometry knowledge, radio telescope knowledge, and apply radio telescopes and dish antenna behavior knowledge without having to look at other domains, except as they work as power supply, they work as communication link, they work as physical asset. So you say, I need to know these other domains only to this extent, to the extent that I depend on them for resource, etc. I have my own view of it. So essentially what we are saying is every object in your system has an abstract view of everything around it. 
everything it interacts with, everything it depends on, it has an abstract context role profile. And so when we model a thing, we should model it in terms of what are the assumptions it makes about all the things around it. Then we can take it and bind it to the model of some actual thing it works. So whether the actual power supply is a transformer or it's a generator or something else, they will all have the same abstract role profile. And you can ask what are the assumptions the design designer made in the design about the power supply? What is the actual power supply providing? Is it matching those assumptions? So that is really the way we should be doing it. So that your system integration can effectively be a matter of integrating the models. So you're actually creating an independent model of the antenna, an independent model of the transformer, and then having a notion of when is the binding valid? It's valid if the other objects satisfy the assumptions that you've made about it. This is called the assume guarantee principle in systems engineering. Okay, all well-known ideas in theory. So the next question is, okay, so this is how knowledge domains connect to each other from the point of view of systems. The next question is, how do you actually model a system? What content should you put into a system model? Obviously, that depends on what do you want to do with the model. What do you want to do with the model is, you want to analyze, I want this behavior. How do I know whether my model will give me this behavior? So the question is, what do you need to account in order to take into account to be able to say, if I have this particular configuration, what behaviors will it produce? Okay. So it turns out what you need to do is you need to look at the functionality and the quality attributes. So you look at the state and structure, you look at the interactions, flows, etc. And this gives you a basic theory in the domain, which you can apply to say with this pattern of organization, what functional behavior is it going to display and associate a quality. So this is the first base part that you must put in. The next part you must put in is variety. It is not that it has a single state and structure and a single set of interactions and a single context and so on. You may want to deal with a variety of contexts, a variety of interactions, a variety of this, etc. And you may also need to deal with undesired inputs. That is, when you model it initially, you say, I'll get these inputs. But what if some other inputs come in? For example, what if your antenna rusts because the atmosphere has humidity in it? And even though you didn't particularly want an interaction that says, you know, a humid atmosphere interacts with the metal and makes it rust. Yeah, unfortunately, you're going to get it anyway. So you need to consider all these spontaneously arising inputs and processes and its effect on the system in terms of pathologies and faults. So this is in systems theory, this is called variety analysis. So you need to do not only basic functional knowledge and uh, application, but you need to do a variety application, which of course we do in terms of um, uh, scenario testing and uh, equivalence classes and so on. So we do in fact worry about variety in engineering. The next part is dynamics. Your system is starting with the various processes. So you have basic operational processes and then you have control, life cycle process, everything. What you're really creating is a network of processes. And that is where systems theory tells you, if you get network of processes, they, start, they may start showing complexity phenomena. They may show emergent behavior. You may get tipping points and so on. And uh, we know that that you have a wire or you have a physical material, over time it wears out, at some point it breaks. When it breaks, you're hitting a tipping point and it goes to a new behavioral regime and so on. Or if you're filling a tank, at some point the water will overflow. At which point you're going through a tipping point and moving to a different regime. So this is really where system theory comes in. System theory starts telling you about the behavior of the network of processes. You need to worry about the short-term dynamics, the medium-term dynamics and the long-term dynamics. So short-term dynamics is um, your basic, you know, CFT and so on, basic simple dynamics equations. Medium term is things like uh, tipping points and so on, things that cause structural changes to the system. Long term is like requirements changes and so on. So you, are, you actually have three kinds of forces acting on the system. Your basic physical sources, you have uh, structural change forces, and then you have uh, stakeholder intention, uh, this thing. So they give you three kinds of dynamics. Uh, In addition, sorry, yeah, there, there are a few questions. Shall I ask right now? Sure. sure. Okay. So the first question is from Yoga. Uh, where do the system constraints assumptions come in? The constraints extra are part of all this functionality pattern of organization extra. So the actual knowledge in the pattern of organization and quality attributes will actually give you constraints. If I have this and this will behave like this, or if suppose you have pressure and temperature, you'll say here they are constrained by this equation energy balance. All of the constraints are built into your knowledge 
primarily at this level, but actually at all of these levels. Is it at this level or slightly the before? It? Sorry. Will it be at this level or slightly before that? It will. It be at the boundary of this level. Uh, How would it actually? Boundaries are built into each of this is actually a, a a dimension of consideration. So the the dimension includes the system, the boundary, the interactions, all of that, and constraints are part of the knowledge. So the knowledge includes equations. The knowledge includes attributes. What faults can occur? What processes take place? And it includes the constraints. At least that's how I see it. I mean, maybe when you think of constraints, you're thinking of something else. If you look at constraint layer, cost constraint, that's a very different thing. It comes in an intent system. But the the actual system constraints, target system constraints, uh, uh, apply at this level, functional, but also at these levels. I mean, it's just part of the knowledge of how these levels play out. If you have more discussion on this, we'll postpone it to the end. I, I mean, I may not be correct. Maybe I'm saying something wrong, but we can discuss it later. Other questions, Mudu? Yes. So there are a couple of questions from Nikhil. Uh, Nikhil, do you want sure. to uh, talk talk to them? Uh, well, I, I, I meant those. Uh, hi, this is Nikhil. I just meant those as discussion questions. We could take them at at the end uh, more towards the discussion questions let them take at the end just because yeah. i'm a little the uncomfortable coverage of the model, you know? we'll take it to the end yeah okay because sure. i'm a little uncomfortable about time okay i mean there's right. no point in maybe so time if nobody understands which is why i want to take the discussion you know clarification questions now but discussion we'll take at the end right right, right. sure huh. anything more with it uh, no let's let's go ahead okay thank you okay now, around the basic from your pattern of organization and variety and dynamics, you also have planes of operation. These have to do with human intent systems, where human intents mean around your system that may be a control system, okay, monitoring, feedback control, fault, fault handling, all of the control and operational management. And then you may have life cycle, okay. The, everything about you know deployment require does it meet requirements stakeholder values this extra managing the complete life cycle of the system and its changes and then there's identity management and governance where you're actually monitoring the value to stakeholders and if there are gaps then you're deciding here are some new requirements to be met etc okay so you've got basically three levels of i mean you've got these different levels planes of operation plus the resource and structural verification plan I forgot to mention this, which actually provides the resources. Suppose your system needs power, it needs communications and so on. You're actually providing the resources and flows and so on. So this becomes a, a planes of operation surrounding your uh, basic consideration of this, this, and this. It is not so much that these are different from the system itself, but that this is from an analysis point of view, you need to make sure you include all these dimensions. They're all cross-cutting dimensions. We are not saying they're separate things. Other bit is from levels of organization, functional, technical, technological. The same system can be described at different levels. You can describe it at the functional abstraction level. You can describe it in technical terms, in terms of things like uh, databases and communication links and so on. And then you can describe it at technological level, where you say this is the very specific kind of um, um, you know, suppose a bridge, you say this is the bridge technology or this is the tunneling technology, this is the network technology and so on, very specific protocols and so on. So the same system, you, you are simply creating different description levels. And why do you need to create all those description levels? Because that is the way we organize knowledge. There's only one system, but we build knowledge separately at the uh, technological level, technical level and functional level. So you have one collection of equations and relationships and concerns and patterns at this level, another set at the next level, another set at the third level. So in order to apply knowledge, we need to describe the system at all of those levels and make sure all the knowledge is applied and all the models are consistent with each other. Finally, the system has context impacts. Having done all this, you must make sure that the effect of the system on the context and the effect of the context on the system and consequences, including possibly negative, environmental, everything like that. So this is basically a, a theoretical model, a system science model of the dimensions of concerns that engineering modeling needs to address. 
It says bring in this body of knowledge about your basic function. Make sure it includes variety knowledge. Think about all the variety. Make sure you do your dynamics analysis. Make sure you have taken into account all the planes of operation, ecosystem process that go around the system. And make sure you have thought about the interplay with the context. And make sure you do this at all the levels of administration. So this is a, a theory of completeness of engineering modeling. That's what this is. Okay. This is really explaining the idea of planes of operation more. Let's say you have primary functional processes. Then you have the resource facilitation like input output resource acquisition. You have more processes than these, only putting a few. And then control net, monitoring control, fault net. Then life cycle monitoring, monitoring And then this identity management, which is worldview, world definition, decision making, constraints. These process, which are really in a mechanistic system, they become the process that you look at stakeholder value and feedback if you have got gaps in stakeholder value and so on. So that becomes the identity management and governance. So this is the, uh, again, a theoretical model of the different uh, levels of ecosystemic considerations that need to be taken into account. That each of these gives rise to uh, multiple processes when you consider the complete network of system process, you should include all of these dimensions. Most of the time when we model the process in a system, we, we often drop only the basic operational processes. But really when you're engineering, all of us think about the life cycle process, we think about the control process, but we never look on them as a complete network. And really, if, as we start, start, you know, start to worry about complexity phenomena, we should be thinking about the complete network generated by all of these processes. So now that gives you a notion of theoretically what all do we need to consider. So then let us ask what would the resulting model look like? So now when I talk about the model here, I'm talking about modeling a one, um, uh, the system at one level of organization and one level of the hierarchy. So if I've got a radio telescope, you can do this only for the dish antenna level. You will have one more similar model for the, let's say the motor level or for the feeds or so on. So any given entity, you model in terms of here is my antenna. My antenna has parts, could be like feed and motor and dish and so on. And these have interactions with each other. In addition, it has resource providers, input providers, users, physical environment, control life cycle management, system owner, consequences, you know, services it needs in order to function, service exchange partners. Oh, so service it produces, service exchange partners, and then also, I think operator is missing here. Okay. You may have that also. But the point is, you have a bunch of context roles. So you want to model the context roles. For each of this, you want to characterize it in terms of for every context role and for every part and for the system itself, you want to look at what is the functionality, what is all the desired variety, what is the interactions, what is the trajectory of change over time, what are the states relationship. Okay. So Unless you, if you categorize, if you characterize every part this way and every context role this way, and then you bind, suppose you have a model like this, you know, this whole picture, you have one such model of the dish antenna and another such model of the motor and another such model of the thing. Then you can actually bind them and say, what is, what assumptions have dish antenna made about motor? If motor is satisfying it, then you are allowed. If similarly, the motor model has a place for dish antenna, which is transparent, then you ask what assumptions is it making? If it's making the assumption that the parent will send it control commands or it will provide it physical infrastructure or something, then you ask for those assumptions satisfied. And so then you do a modular integration of your model prior to the modular integration of the system. So what this is a canonical theoretical model of what should be included in system model. Okay. So this is a, um, uh, what we have done is we have actually looked at the nature of knowledge. How do knowledge bits relate to each other? Come up with the idea of these context roles. We talked about the context roles. The assumptions that say dish antenna makes about the motor, but also the assumptions it makes about users, the assumptions it makes about the power supply. 
So uh, uh, if you bring in your modeling practice, if you include all those assumptions and then you do binding, then you can do your integration at the model level rather than having to do it at the do it at the. Uh, so there's a question on: Can you expand on the trajectory of change? Trajectory of change has to do with I talked about the network dynamics. The dynamics are network of processes. So if you really want to assert that my dish antenna will deliver these characteristics. And you want to assert it in the presence of change over its lifetime. Suppose you say, today I have got a design, and I can say my dish antenna is this way, but one of the requirement my user placed was on evolvability. The dish antenna should be able to evolve. Now, what does evolve mean? One of the things we know about a dish antenna is people may invent new kinds of feeds, and what to say because uh, they will invent a new feed type. And say no, no. Today uh, I have my dish antenna with this, but now I'd like to add a new feed to it, or something like that. So the trajectory of changes. I know the feed will change. I know communication bandwidth will increase. I know that users are likely to want to conduct more ambitious experiments that require more data. So my new feed may produce more data, but my communication technology may also evolve, and I'll have to change my power supply. So you are putting the trajectory of change on each, and asking, are you making compatible assumptions? About communication, power supply uh, requirements change, and so on. So technology change requirements change. Are you making um, uh, compatible assumptions? Under what assumptions can you assert that your model will continue to deliver the behaviors here? Right. And you may actually come up with constraints. I can meet a new feed requirement provided my bandwidth increases like this, and provided my power increases like this, etc. Really, that is the way we should be modeling systems. Today, we are not there yet. Okay, I'll move on to modeling behavior. So, the behavior idea is talking about. Now, we are actually talking about what is the behavior of the system. How do we model it? Today, the way we do behavioral modeling is we go into MATLAB or something and then create a bunch of behavioral models about uh, how the uh, system. But let's look at it from a theoretical point of view. What should be consider things like. If you close wall, flow rate becomes zero. This is something we understand, right? If you close the wall, what you expect is the flow rate should become zero. If you turn on a light, you expect that the room will become brighter. If you initiate a transaction, you expect that either a response will be received, or there will be an error message, or there will be a timeout, or something like that. So you may have some such expectation. But what do we actually put into our model? Very often, our models contain these, but this remains in our head. The second half. Okay, um, a simulation model will, uh, or a black box model will typically actually talk about the effect of closing a wall with flow rate is zero. When you build a simulation, that's what you put into it. But in our actual system model, we don't put that in. So white box modeling languages express the actions performed, but don't provide the ability to express outset, expected outcomes, particularly if those outcomes are in the physical world and not inside the system. So if it's inside my system, I may put it in my model. But if it's outside the system, I don't typically put it in my model. The black box model may express action outcome relationship at the level of the system as a whole or whatever level you're constructing the black box. But at that level, you're not relating it to the internal structures and internal processes. So you're actually losing the information about what is the effective, expected effect of internal actions. In fact, for programmers, you know, when you do assert statements and so on, that's what you're doing. You're saying, I know that my procedure ought to provide this result at the end. But by default, the modeling environments don't ask you to provide that. So this action consequence relationship is often only in requirements test cases simulations and in black box models. Why don't you provide this in the white box model? Because the behavior is contingent on the context. I mean, is this even true? What if the bulb burns out? Will the room become brighter? What if the wall leaks? Will the flow rate become zero? So because you have this contingency, your consequences can only be expectations. So you have action and consequence, but the consequence is actually an assertion. It's a expectation, okay? And subject to context assumptions. If I assume something about the context, suppose I say I have a toaster. Uh, if I uh, uh, turn on the toaster, the toast will go from white to brown to black over time, okay? That is true, provided I insert toast. What happens if I insert paper? Something very different happens, right? So you're already making assumptions about the context when you specify consequences. What we do in our system modeling approaches, we have already put in the context assumption through the context role profile. 
So we can say, provided that assumption happens, I can make this assertion as an engineer about what I expect to happen. When you do that, you make data, it's possible for data science to ask, do what you said would happen. And data science monitoring can actually ask, and did the system really behave that way or did it do something different? So by adding action consequence, we enable data science to check the expectations we have in our mind when we do engineering. What is the language for doing that? Any observation data you can model as an observation with the time T, the timestamp saying here is when I collected the monitoring data, or this is when the observation actually happened. But you can also add a sequence identifier that reflects which is the transaction thread to which it belongs. If you look at it, we actually do that. We, when we actually put a log file entry, we put a transaction ID or something. But we don't have a piece of theory that says the nature of an observation is an observation, sub timestamp, sub sequence thread. Okay. And if you do that, then, okay, even a continuous system observation still has a sequence thread because there's an initiating event, a process instance. When you do that, you can actually correlate related information. So if you say a transaction arrived, then it processed, then it there was a response, you can actually talk about what is the latency because you have a language in which to express the idea of the transaction arrival and the transaction leaving and so on and say, my expected behavior of the system is, this is the latency between the transaction arrival and uh, leaving and so on. Or this is the functional relationship or the content of this transaction into input and this transactional output, etc. So what we are really doing here is we are adding a language for describing behavior. Once you do that, suppose somebody gives you an error message report, let's say. that says when I change channels on the TV, the screen goes blank, then the sound cuts over. Then I We're just telling you what is the experience behavior. You now have a structured language to express it. The operation change channels of T is expected to, or is asserted to produce the outcome. The screen at time T plus T1 is a blank screen. On the T plus T2 is, uh, goes to the target channel sound. And at T3, it goes to a target channel picture where T1 less than T2 less than T3. And you can actually leave T1 T through T3 unspecified. And then a monitoring tool can actually figure out the values of T1, T2, T3, as well as checking is this universally true or is it only true some other time. So essentially what you have done is you've created a structured vocabulary for expressing the experience, which is linkable to engineering models. So you're actually creating a link between the data science view of the world and the engineering view of the world. Okay. And even a parametric equation is actually of this form. If you ask what is the nature of uh, all the into MATLAB, etc., they're actually making statements about the observable behavior of the system and saying at all times t force must be mass times acceleration or something like that. So today when we create MATLAB model, we are already assuming that the system is in a particular state and say for that state, here are the equations. But now you have a language where you can actually put those conditions and say, when it is in this state, I expect this relationship to hold between observables and so on. Okay. By the way, there is some patterns. So really what we're doing is at the theoretical level, we are saying the nature of occurrence is that an entity has states and properties. At runtime, you get events and interactions. The events and interactions have parameters. Events have occurrence patterns, the interactions have occurrence patterns, parameters have distributions of values. And you know the pattern of change over time of properties and entities and states. And when you model the interaction, you can model how they update the properties, how they update the state, and how they influence how the states and properties influence the interactions and events and the parameter distributions and so on. So you're actually you can build an observations model of this form that says this is what I expect to happen at runtime. I expect to see these patterns of change. I expect to see that the interaction should modify the state this way, etc. And in many ways, that's what our current behavioral models actually are. So this is actually putting a theory under behavioral modeling and showing how you can link it to data science. Okay, uh, last bit of the presentation. Uh, we have now come back to the original one where we have talked about what is the nature of knowledge, what is the nature of the system model, what is the nature of occurrences, what is the nature of you know the patterns of change and so on. What is the nature of the behavior that you observe as a result of these occurrences, which is the object. And we haven't actually talked about stakeholder value, but you could model that. And uh, so, and then what we are really saying is with, with the, uh, we have 
talking about how do you build an integrated model where you can link the knowledge to the system model, link the uh, data and occurrences to the system model, have a unified modeling, and then you can support contextualization, decontextualization. How do you do that? Basically, you create tooling, data science tech tooling, which looks at the black box behavior, reverse engineers back to occurrences, system models, and down to knowledge. Okay, based on commonalities. And then you build engineering tooling, which starts with knowledge, pulls it together, builds up this, and so on. And so there's a framework for decontextualization that actually says, you know, you get the time series data, figure out the entity occurrences, figure out the event and process occurrences. And then from it, you actually build, derive uh, based on commonalities. What do you have by way of different types and roles? And build the knowledge. This is essentially an environment for supporting the scientific process. Okay. It's pretty obvious stuff. It looks very fancy in this picture, but if you took time, you'd realize it. So the summary is we are actually presenting a framework that says how do you model knowledge? How do you model systems? How do you model data? How do you say, organize knowledge based on the type tag? Model systems as a generic block model with contextual profiles. Model data with the optics decomposition, which actually allows you to put networks of equations describing the interactions and how they lead to patterns of change, change of state over time. So it basically what you're doing is you're describing the system as a series of generative levels. And then once you have this way of approaching, you can actually uh, build an engineering framework to support it that supports contextualization and decontextualization. Obviously, there is room for a huge amount of tooling in this area. And um, obviously, TCS already is working on a tool in this area. Some of you may have heard of this tool called PreMap, PreMap ICME. So we are actually building a tool in this area, which is actually supporting knowledge-centric model-based systems engineering. Okay. So the idea is exactly to model the system as having multiple levels of knowledge, and model how the knowledge can be used to generate the system, and then link it to the data and so on. Okay, I think I took a bit more time than I should have. Uh, no issues at all. Uh, thanks, thanks for that wonderful session. Uh, we do have few questions, so I think uh, I'll switch way, to. I'm, uh, let me clarify. I am available till 7.30 and I think the, okay. uh, the Zoom is booked till 7.30. So sure. uh, uh, those of you who need to leave by 7 are welcome to leave, but sure. if you want to stay on and listen, we can discuss in peace. Absolutely. Uh, that would be great. So um, maybe I'll try to take the first question uh, here. So mm -hmm. uh, Nikhil asks, uh, um, do we assume that knowledge let about me, the bring up the Zoom. And, uh, in fact, Oh, yeah, yeah, one minute. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. No, please go ahead. Yeah, if you uh -huh. want, you can bring up the chat. Uh, I'll bring can... up the chat. Yeah, I think that will be easy, easy for you as well because, yeah. Uh, chat here like that. Okay, will do. Yeah. Right. So here, Nikhil is asking this question. Do we assume that knowledge about the world is finite? How do we ensure knowledge needed for intent is covered? That's the first question. Okay. Okay, uh, let me hold that and uh, answer that and then move to the next one. Yes, yes. The uh, world is not finite and it's correct. Okay, so knowledge is simply a model that we create that has explanatory and predictive power to some level of accuracy. You can go deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. It is not finite from a breadth point of view also because <clears throat> How many properties does a thing have? Suppose I have a mouse. How many properties does it have? How many properties it has depends on the stakeholder, right? Yes. I can invent properties that I care about. I may care about, uh, you know, uh, um, the mouse play with the color scheme of my room, for example. And this will become a new body of knowledge that requires a new theory and so on. So, the, the, there is something called the Cano model, which talks about how value, the space of value is fundamentally unlimited. And uh, it is um, asymptotic, but still unlimited. And therefore, you can always create new dimensions of value. And therefore, knowledge is not finite from any point of view. It is not accurate. It is not limited. 
you only have a current best knowledge that we are applying as engineers to hopefully design a system that works. So as a matter of theory, you can assert that you will always need testing. One of the things that this theory actually does, it explains very clearly why you need testing because knowledge by definition is only the inferences you have made about the world. Okay. Generally our abstractions and knowledge rules evolve and we maintain alternate abstractions. How can we manage this property of knowledge and we think about knowledge uh, models as static. Okay. So the answer is exactly yes. You may, uh, the, the, the things do evolve over time. When you may maintain a body of knowledge, you must maintain it, including multiple versions, multiple hypotheses with confidence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they will change over time. So anytime you do analysis of a model, you build a model statically, you analyze it. You're saying it's relative to my knowledge. I have reasonable confidence that my system will work. So all those, you know, I talked about uh, theory of compositionality, uh, variety, dynamics, everything. You do all that analysis. It says subject to my assumptions and subject to my knowledge. I have confidence that my behavior will work. Subject of course, tractability of all the being able to work through all the equations. So in reality, all of that has limitations. So engineering is fundamentally a limited activity for all those reasons. Nikhil, does that answer, answer your question? Uh, so I think Nikhil is not online. Uh, he had okay. to leave That's for fine. another call. That's fine. That's but fine. we'll still take the questions. Uh, okay. I have one. But uh, okay. hopefully, that that yeah. hopefully that answers that question. Hopefully that answers that question. Let me take yeah. uh, some of Yoga's questions. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. 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 Uh, this is regarding the uh, you know you, you were talking about the trajectory of change. So it's a very mm -hmm. nice concept. But how do uh -huh. you visualize capturing it in the model? I mean, I that doesn't. Uh, the answer is I don't have an answer. Hi. <laughs> same thing. Some but, of us have to but, figure out the notation. Roughly yes. We do it. The way current engineering practice does it is in terms of change scenarios. So you would have heard of something called uh, there is a particular technique. Mm -hmm. SAM, S A A M, Software Architecture Analysis Method. Okay. Uh, Carnegie Mellon people invented it about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And SAM basically is very, very straightforward. You simply put in scenarios of change. I expect the antenna to add new feeds periodically. I expect uh, computing power to grow at 20% per year. Okay. Things like this. And then you apply the scenario to your system and say, given this trajectory of change on this dimension and this dimension and this dimension. How do I think my system is consistent? How much effort will it be to uh, accommodate the change in my system, depending on what requirement you're trying to satisfy? But scenarios is one way of capturing trajectory of change because not all change is nice, simple, quantitative. If it's nice and quantitative, you can just draw a curve and say, here it is, here's the trajectory of change. But in reality, requirements change, etc. is simply. Uh, probabilistic scenarios of, you know, this can happen, this can happen. But the point is we actually have a lot of knowledge about what is likely to change. And we have requirements that say we must design a system that is resilient to various forces, including change. Does this work yoga? Yeah, it works. It works. Okay. Ah, you had other questions? Yeah, I will anybody drop on the off call? seven. I have a meeting, so I'll drop. Okay. Sure thing. Th thank you. Thank, thank you so you much. Are. A very interesting talk. And uh, we actually resonate. We also had a paper on similar lines in the IS 2020. So oh, very nice. Uh, re the really, is the really name? good. Um, this was on MIDAS, M-I-D-A-S. Yes, I saw that. Was a MIDAS yeah. Yeah. Huh. So we, we are looking at something very similar, you know, knowledge and all that. But then I okay. these things seem to be new to our idea. The trajectory of change was okay. something new, which I actually liked because we, we didn't consider that. So I think that's well, the reason the trajectory of change arises is because of a dynamics analysis. Exactly. Exactly. We do have that, but then how do you actually model it was that something we, everybody has to, I think, will it be domain specific? You think? And the idea of Sam scenarios is very straightforward. Create a scenario in two lines, human readable. <laughs> and therefore the right. it. it's very, I mean, the actual content will be domain specific. But the idea of Sam is very trivial. Okay. If you now ask uh, in many domains, would you want to come up with a more specialized and more sensible way to model trajectory of change? The answer is possibly yes. Suppose I'm looking at a hotel and I'm trying to look at elevators. I may want to have a trajectory of change of 
um, how does the uh, 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 throughput, the number of people wanting to use the elevator, etc., how will that change? How will the number of floors in the building change over time? And then ask, under what assumptions will my elevator design still work? Yeah, yeah. Maybe so that could be a property that model. could be added to the model, right? So it for is, every I mean, item, just that you could perhaps support. have a... Absolutely. I mean, yes. all of what I described is exactly a theory for building systems engineering tooling. Right, right. I mean, mo most of this would be, a, we actually do in practice. It is not the case that you and I don't think about this. It is that our tools don't support it well enough. Exactly. That is what we found. We, we need to this develop entire research uh, is to, tooling. Yes. 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 The purpose of this entire research is it is system science research, which will provide the basis for systems engineering tooling. Today, the basis of system engineering tooling is what users demand and common sense and general knowledge about system engineering. So now we are formalizing it enough so that people who are building tools can say, am I supporting all of this stuff in terms of expressive power of the model? in terms of the ability to modularly, modularly compose models, things like that. Right, right, right. So we're actually providing a theoretical basis for people to do all that work. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Swami. Uh, really uh, good. Uh, sorry to interrupt on this front. Uh, do you really mean uh, the trajectory uh, of changes uh, also refer to the behavioral changes? Behavior will be part of it? Uh, if behave, that's a perfectly good idea. And yes, I did mean that I had forgotten about it, but you're absolutely right. Suppose you want to say that I have a dish antenna. I know the dish antenna warps over the lifetime. The shape of the dish antenna changes. It's uh, reflectivity and so on changes, albedo and so on change over time due to various forces, uh, rusting and uh, so many other things. And therefore, I know, and I also know that periodically I will repair it, I will repaint it, I'll maintain it like this. Then you actually know a particular curve, right? That a property will change over time by going on worsening and then suddenly improving and then going on worsening and then suddenly improving. And it makes perfect sense to be able to capture the graph along with that property as a trajectory of change. And then use it in analysis. Notice that what I'm doing is I'm creating theory. The notion of whether we have the ability to create tools that will be able to take such a sophisticated input and analyze it through uh, uh, fancy differential equations and so on. That's the next step. It's a computational problem. What I'm trying to do is provide the theory so that somebody can create the language for expressing trajectory of change so that somebody else can create tooling that will take trajectory of change into account and analysis. I mean, between Creating a lovely theoretical statement and having it actually useful to engineers, there is many years of gap. Okay, thank you. So, so subject to that. Okay, this is making sense, right? I mean, because we yes, actually yes. have to change for many, many things. We just don't see it as something to put into the model because our tools don't give us the ability to do so. And notice that all this, the idea of putting it in the model, also data science can help you. Data science can tell you. I noticed this is how the behavior of the antenna is changing over time. This is how the behavior of the elevator is changing over time. My car is changing over time. Right? We actually gather the data these days, we actually have the information. And so putting it into the model means that you know you're reducing burden on the engineer and adding to what the tool can do, tools can do for you. So the, one of the big ideas here is to create a round trip between knowledge system models and data. Is this working? Especially when we say this is the range of possible the input values for this input value here is the behavior. Every one of those specifications is checkable by data. The data can say you provided me these 14 scenarios, but what I observed in real behavior is you also have a 15th and a 16th and a 17th. And then you add them to the system and then through decontextualization, you add it to knowledge. And so over time, your knowledge about what all can happen to a system grows. Not just at the organization level, but at the domain level. So well, one of the ideas here is to be able to build domain knowledge about failure modes, domain knowledge about trajectories of change. Right. But I mean, uh, we, moving it into data, uh, sorry, to, sorry, sorry to sorry. interrupt, uh, moving it into the data science or uh, that can be captured, uh, are we not uh, li limiting its scope? 
the scope of we're moving uh, into data science no what we are trying to do is we are not moving into data science we are saying data science is an additional tooling that should okay, be part of our system engineering life cycle so yeah. a fundamental thing is today as engineer when you design no you have a huge amount of uh, thinking about if i make the design decision how will my system behave and if design decision you have an expectation of how it will behave should you not should that not go directly into the model should that not then get verified at run time against log files against monitoring data against whatever is possible to ask is it behaving that way if it behaving differently should you not as an engineer be told by your tooling that hey you know you thought this would happen but in fact this is also happening why don't you update it i mean it makes no sense that we don't have those tools today those are the gaps we are trying to fix here yeah yeah i mean that when we say industry 4.0 it's nice but really i have i don't see them going this far and my question is why not do you mean by saying we have all this data if we can't even use it for our own engineering and in fact we do right i mean if you look at how any of your company is actually building equipment you are actually building in the ability to continuously monitor over the lifetime of it what is happening to the equipment etc the question is how do you flow it back into system models and all those models yep anything more me uh <clears throat> so we do have one more question on the chat uh, but sure. can anybody oh, ask any question uh, no 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 uh, so uh, the second question is again from nikhil so he had a two part question uh, the second question was uh -huh. generally our abstractions and knowledge rules evolve how can we manage this properly i, I handled that i thought i meant oh okay. i mentioned that i answered that actually right, right, right. okay okay said, yes of course they evolve but you are only doing your analysis against a point in time mm -hmm. and therefore it absolutely has to be versioned and you have to deal with it that way sure sure any assertion you make through analysis only says relative to my knowledge i think it works and then you add the data science so that you keep expanding the knowledge so what we are really doing with this is we are trying to try to create a full round trip with knowledge that was what the generator picture was about right it's actually showing refinement of knowledge mm -hmm. So the idea is to build a whole tooling and so on that will enable you to continually refine the knowledge. Okay. So I think with that uh, we have all the questions taken. If there are no more questions, uh, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Swami, on behalf of the whole Incosa India chapter. Uh, it was a very interesting talk, and uh, thanks for uh, sharing your knowledge today. Thank you very much. thank you i i really enjoyed the i you know thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you for the nice questions and uh, by the way i am um, trying to work up a project in this area that the incosi india chapter can do so i'll get in touch with you if you about it if anybody is interested i'll be happy to work with you on it sure okay. sure def definitely definitely i'll come back to you thank you thank you okay thank you thank you everyone thank you dr swami bye